Our first reading this morning is a brief one from Matthew. 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The second reading for today comes from Paul's letter to the new church in Rome. Um, All of this month of May, the narrative lectionary has us reading um, from the letter to the Romans, which is one of the New Testament's most challenging and potentially rewarding um, pieces of text. So let's listen together to what Paul had to say to those very, very early Christians in Rome. It's, it's two segments. One comes from chapter 3, another comes from chapter 5. Hear now the word of God. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law? Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not also the God of Gentiles? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. We uphold the law. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access to faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ whom we have now, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The word of the Lord. I wonder how many of you glazed over or drifted away while I was reading that passage. You don't have to raise your hands. That's what often happens to me when I read Paul. When the language is especially vague or when its connection to reality seems especially tenuous, I drift away to thoughts about my children, to thoughts about this vast tradition in which we stand, to thoughts about my calling here. Today, I drift toward a question Dietrich Bonhoeffer asked in 1943 a question most of us have probably asked, a question that we ought to ask, especially if we look around this room and calculate our average age. The question is this, are we still of any use? By we, 
Bonhoeffer means the Christian church. That question seems all the, more, all the more pressing when the church plunks us down in front of a passage of Scripture that seems blind to the actual world. I've begun to grow concerned about my reaction to the killing stories that scroll and scroll across the screen. Unless the dead reach record numbers or the stories have some kind of special hook, I don't even read them anymore. Their persistence, their proliferation, their seeming popularity make it even harder to believe that hanging out in rooms like this with other old fogies whose attention drifts away from the scripture that's supposed to be our light is still of any use. Our children don't appear to think so. In 1953, when Flannery O'Connor, whom Mark mentioned earlier, wrote a story ab about mass shooting, back then, events like that were tools of fiction, which might be used to make a reader think about his moral posture. Back then, O'Connor could give her killer a line like, she would have been a good woman if it, had be, if it had been someone there to shoot her every minute of her life, without being afraid that readers would put down the book and go lock the door. Nowadays, there kind of is somebody there to shoot us every minute of our life. Is it her? Is it you? That tool of fiction, which Flannery O'Connor used in 1953, has become a fact of life on our watch. Are we still of any use? Last week, Stephanie read the opening verses of Paul's letter to the Romans, in which he proclaims, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I'm like, well, duh. But I begin to understand the need to say that. After an especially deranged event in which a Latino man killed eight people in the name of white supremacy, even though white supremacy excludes people like him, Senator Ted Cruz tweeted this, Heidi and I are praying for the families of the victims of the horrific mall shooting in Allen, Texas. You are worse than useless, someone responded, as if answering Bonhoeffer's question. You armed that man. He did exactly what you knew he would do. He did what you wanted him to do, I would say. He bought the bill of goods you sell in the name of the church under the cover of prayer. Someone suggested that we turn the prayer machine off and then turn it back on so that like a computer it could free itself of all the crap our lives attach to it and then maybe it would start to work again. What is the church good for in a culture like Bonhoeffer's which created Adolf Hitler or a culture like ours which creates a steady stream of killing stories overseen by leaders who respond with Christian prayer. If we answer that the church is a refuge from that killing, that its goodness consists in opening a way for you and me to access the easy yoke and the light burden that Jesus mentions in Matthew 11, then it's disingenuous to wonder why our children are not here. They don't want a refuge. They want a better world. Bonhoeffer believed that the institutional church was collapsing under what he called the burden of the self-chosen way. One manifestation of the self-chosen way is our habit of repeating words we've inherited from this vast, astonishing tradition without knowing what they mean. 
Paul's words are especially hard to fathom for a couple of reasons. One is that he's speaking into a context which is entirely foreign to us, but which we tend to conflate with our own. The other is that Paul was struck by lightning, as my cousin David says. Every time we read Paul, we have to remember that he's speaking out of something like Christ shock, an experience that exploded his way of looking at and living in the world in an instant not through a process of education and experience that changes one's perspective over time, as might be true for you or for me, but in an instant. That's what makes him hard to understand. After reading Paul's letters for the first time when I was in my 20s, I concluded that he was to blame for the gulf that seemed to separate Jesus from Christianity as I knew it, So I ignored him for like 30 years. He says weird stuff. He says things that contradict what Jesus says. He speaks always as a person who has been violently expelled from the worldview which had organized his life and the life of his people for hundreds of years. Expelled not into some other worldview, but into nothing. He's hard to understand and hard to like because he's constantly trying to create, through speech, a way of looking at the world that derives from and embraces the shock of Christ. You and I take that way of looking at the world for granted because Western culture has stood in it for 2,000 years. But until Paul opened his mouth, that worldview did not exist. His letter to the Roman church ranks among the most influential documents in Western culture because it spells out more thoroughly, more emphatically, more confusingly than any other what used to be true but isn't anymore. And what has come to be true about reality because of Christ. In the context that we're surveying, what I really dislike about Paul is his insistence that there isn't any difference between the non-white guy who killed those shoppers in the name of white supremacy or the leaders who sold that guy the narrative of white supremacy and you and me. Do you believe that? Is that the way you feel about yourself? Until I understand that truth and accept it, Paul insists, I don't have a chance of understanding and believing the corollary truth that in Christ, everything that that speaks against me is refuted. Those two truths rank among the most important statements Christianity has ever uttered, which is why we keep reading Paul even though we barely understand what he says. My effort to secure the second truth, that in Christ everything that speaks against me is refuted without acknowledging the first, that there's no difference between me and those killers or those senators or those book banners, That effort is the self-chosen way which has all but destroyed the institutional church by allowing us to see it as a place where the yoke is easy and the burden is light without trying to understand what those words mean. What speaks against me most insistently and most insidiously is the inner voice that says, I'm different from those people, which really means I'm better than those people. I confess to all of you that I still think that. I still think that because I've never killed anybody, 
because I don't pursue power by preying on people's fears, because I don't try to keep people from learning facts, all of which are wrong things to do, I still believe that because of that, I'm better than the people who do them. And that belief is exactly what speaks against me. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? Because of the law that requires what? Because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Justified is one of those words that's hard for us to handle because we want to connect it with justice. And in the worldview that Christ exploded, it did. Under that old worldview, justification meant looking at myself in the mirror of the law, which I am compelled to do by the voice inside me that always wonders, did I do it right? Am, am, am I good enough? That voice loves the law for its capacity to tell me, yeah, you did it right, for its capacity to make me what I want to be, which is right. That voice speaks in all of us. It controls our inner dialogue to varying degrees, depending on all kinds of life experiences. But it's always there. Job describes it as the thing that makes him turn away from his fellows, which is exactly the thing that makes Adam hide from God in the Garden of Eden, which is, in turn, the inevitable consequence of the self-chosen way. After Christ's shock, the word justified no longer has anything to do with, say, forcing Donald Trump to pay Jean Carroll $5 million for sexually assaulting her. That's justice in my view, not in Paul's. For Paul, justification means that everything that speaks against Donald Trump is refuted in Christ, as is my hatred of that truth and everything else that speaks against me. Even my desire to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am better than killers and cheats. That too is refuted in Christ. Another word that's hard for us to deal with is enemies. Paul says, while I was still God's enemy, Christ died for me. He speaks in the first person singular, not the first person plural. And in Paul's case, that speech is accurate. Paul was, in fact, God's enemy. Certainly Christ's enemy. That's what Paul did for a living. He traveled through Israel, Judea, Palestine, searching for evidence of individuals and groups of people who believed that Jesus was the Son of God. And he dragged those people into religious assemblies where they were tried and whipped or stoned. And one day, while he was doing that for a living, he was knocked out of his way of living in and understanding the world by Christ's shock. At which point, Paul ceased to be God's enemy. I, however, have not been Christ shocked. So I run the grave danger of hearing Paul say, while we were still God's enemies, Christ died for us, and assuming that, like Paul, I am no longer God's enemy. And it's that very assumption, the assumption that I'm no longer in the enemy camp, which proves that I stand in it still. And which, too, is refuted in Christ. Being God's enemy doesn't have to mean traveling the state of Virginia in search of people who believe in God and trying to get them killed. It doesn't have to mean taking my AR-15 to a shopping mall and shooting people in the name of white supremacy. It doesn't have to mean creating a story of victimization and selling it to vulnerable people. All it takes to be God's enemy in the world of Christ's shock is turning my attention toward myself 
away from God, which is what Adam did, which is what all of us do every day, even Paul, all of us but Christ. And Paul says, since we have now been justified by Christ's blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Again, that doesn't mean God is mad at me for turning my attention away as I might be mad at someone who stopped paying attention to me. That's people, not God. In fact, that very attitude, the urge to punish people who turn away from me, derives from exactly what speaks against me, which is refuted in Christ. We know God doesn't have that attitude because Christ doesn't have that attitude. One of the habits that keeps me in the enemy posture is treating words I don't understand as if I did understand them. I do that primarily because it helps me to feel right, which is what I need most of all in the self-chosen way. The words I repeat but don't understand are like body armor for my soul, protecting me against the explosion of Christ's shock. Dear God, wrote Flannery O'Connor, I cannot love you as I want to love you because of myself. The shadow which hides all but a sliver of the glorious moon. I'm afraid myself will grow so large and so dense with shock protection that it will block the moon of God entirely. Many of the stories Flannery O'Connor wrote describe what happens when our shadows block the moon, including the story I mentioned earlier. In that story, an ordinary shock-protected family sets out on vacation and gets lost. In a moment of dramatic revelation, the father of the family runs the car off the road and rolls it over, throwing everybody out into the ditch. In that vulnerable position, the family is discovered by an escaped convict who calls himself the misfit because he can't make all he's done fit the punishment he's been given. He and the grandmother of the family engage in a long theological discussion while his accomplices take the other members of the family into the woods and shoot them one by one. The grandmother tries to save herself by convincing the misfit that he's a good man, far too good a man to shoot a lady but that approach doesn't work because he knows she's selling him a bill of goods. When she says to him what her church has said to her, that he could still be justified before God if he would change his ways and ask Jesus for help, he gets mad. Jesus threw everything off balance, the misfit says. If he did what he said he did, then it's nothing for you to do but throw everything away and follow him. And if he didn't, then it's nothing for you to do but enjoy the few minutes you got left the best way you can by killing somebody or burning down his house. That's the posture of the book of Ecclesiastes, which seems to be ascendant in America today. I wish I'd have been there, the misfit says in a rising voice. If I'd have been there, I would know and I wouldn't be like I am now. It ain't right I wasn't there, he wails. In that moment, O'Connor says the grandmother's head clears and she sees the misfit's face close to her own, twisted as if he's about to cry, and she murmurs, you're one of my babies. You're one of my own children. And she lays her hand on his shoulder. At which point, he jumps back as if he's been bitten by a snake, O'Connor says, and he shoots her three times. 
she dies with a smile on her face. Everything that speaks against her having been refuted. Paul wants us to know that Christ cannot be killed in us. Even in people who try to kill Christ, as Paul did. The Christ in us, that pearl of great price, may be buried under layer after layer of oppression, distortion, rejection, and abuse. <clears throat> so deeply buried that it cannot be found or known or touched by anything but Christ in someone else. That's a way to think about what happens in this story, and it's also a way to think about what needs to happen in our world, where the tool of fiction has become a fact of life. The thing in me that reaches out to touch the misfit is the same thing that's being touched in him. That thing is the Christ in both of us. The Christ in me that's buried under killing story after killing story, under outrage at misjustice, under fear of what might happen to me in a world controlled by power lust, under grief, under loss, under failure, under how it hurts to turn away from God toward myself, the Christ in me that's buried under all of that breaks through the body armor that I build around my soul to touch the Christ that's buried under all those layers of unbearability in the misfit. And everything that speaks against me and against him is refuted. That's the miracle Paul is lifting up to us in Romans. If old fogies like us keep showing up in this room to touch the Christ in one another, the invincible Christ in each of us, then the answer to Bonhoeffer's question is yes. We are still of worth. Amen.